Welcome to Outrage Astrology, I'm Mike. And I'm Brittany. Before we just say things that might piss you off, but if you listen closely, you might learn a little bit of something. Um, aren't we talking about something today, Brittany? What are we talking about? I think we're going to talk about aspects. So this is the second episode in our introductory astrology, and we sort of alluded to this last episode, but now we're going to break down um, in a whole episode everything you need to know about aspects. And if by the end of this podcast you don't understand, at least rudimentarily, how an aspect works, then you might as well just hit yourself in the head with a hammer, because it is a fundamental element of astrology. But it helps tie everything together. Yeah. So... What are, what are aspects? So aspects are how the planets talk to each other, like how they're related to each other. Or the stars, or how the planets talk to the angles. or Yeah, those two. Angles, the angles are really important, actually. Yeah. So maybe just... we should explain again, what's an angle? An angle is a cusp of the angular houses. Hence why they're called angular houses. The, it's the cusp of the first house, the fourth house, the seventh house, in the tenth house, and um, the word see... cusp means the beginning of. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's the one of the few circumstances in a natal chart where you can talk about cusps and not get called a moron, but um, you can tell, you can see where the cusp or an angle is in a chart uh, by one. There'll be a little, I guess, number or not number, two letters next to each one. One's called the AC. One's called the IC, the DC, and the MC. But more importantly, they'll be shown by the fact that the beginning of the house will have a thickened line. Yep. Does that make sense? It does. Makes sense to me. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a thicker, darker line. <laughs> so when you pull up your birth chart, or whoever's birth chart you're looking at, you're going to see little lines running around in the middle of that wheel, and those are showing you the aspects. And you'll notice that each of those lines is running from one point or planet to another point or planet. Yeah. So each aspect is a mathematical distance from the other point or planet. And depending on what that distance is, it tells you how those planets relate to one another. So typically yeah. when you're pulling up your chart, the you're going to see blue lines and you're going to see red lines those show you some of the aspects and usually the blue ones are easier more harmonious and the red ones are more challenging um but oh. go ahead and like get it out of your head that there are really uh every every blue line is good and every red line is bad that's not how it works yeah you need kind of a mixture they're like talents and challenges um yeah so yeah so the more exact that you get to that um angle and we're gonna we're gonna go over this it's gonna make sense in a minute but the more exact to perfect it is the stronger you're gonna feel that aspect this is what we call orbs and orbs really quickly are mike orbs okay so these aspects they're all based on uh geometric principles so Let's say, like, the square. The square is planets that are 90 degrees away from each other, roughly. And uh, if you were to take four planets and place them in a place them at equal distances away from each other within the context of the circular natal chart, you would form a square. Uh, and they're all 90 degrees away out of the 360-degree circle. Um, if the points are if they're exactly 90 degrees away then you have a perfect square an exact square but there's a little bit of variance allowed for any aspect so like they can be instead of 90 degrees away they can be 87 degrees away and it's still counted as a square but the closer it is to 90 the stronger it will be for a square the closer it is to 180 degrees uh the, the stronger it will be when it is in opposition uh, the sextile is 60 degrees. The trine is 120 degrees. The conjunction is zero degrees away. So, yeah, the, the closer they are to being, like you said, exact, that's going to be a zero degree orb. If it's, you know, one or two or three away from being perfect, then it, that's, that's your orb. So if it's a three degree orb, 
like you said, what'd you say, 87 degrees away with a square? That's a three degree orb because it's three less than 90. Yeah, but it's still, like I said, it's still in play. You just, like when you look at somebody's natal chart and you look at all the aspects, and there'll also be a table down at the bottom that shows you the orb variance. It's a little, there'll be little boxes and there'll be a little symbol. There's a little uh, symbol for each aspect down in those little boxes at the bottom of the chart and then there'll be a little number and it'll either be like a negative one which means it's like one aspect or one degree less of being perfect or it'll be like you know a, just a plain two which means it's two degrees more than being an exact aspect it, it doesn't really matter if you see zeros though if it's an exact aspect an exact that's something you really need to pay attention to yeah, and there's also, like you were talking about, you kind of mentioned, there's something called applying or separating. That means, are the planets coming closer together or are they moving away from each other? So applying, the A is they're coming closer to each other and S is separating, they're moving away. Okay, and then how do you interpret the difference, Brittany? So applying aspects, um, in a, it depends on if you're talking about a natal chart or something else, but in yeah. a natal chart, the applying aspects are a little bit stronger um but you know the orb allowance is going to matter more than whether they're applying or separating yes of course so if you see two planets and they're sitting right on top of each other that's a conjunction those yeah, are really important right it's next to each other they blend their energies yes so, like, what, what kind of conjunctions do we have in our chart? Actually, you have quite a few conjunctions, Brittany. You have more than I do. I, yeah, I do. I have, um, well, so first of all, conjunction is, you know, between a 7 and 10 degree orb. We uh, use, we, that's, that's how I use them because most people say, especially with the luminaries, with the sun and moon, you can use yeah. up to a 10 degree orb. Um, can, because conjunctions are so much stronger, when you go and look at any astrological textbook, conjunctions are typically typically going to give you a little bit larger of an orb to work with. Yeah, and a lot of it's going to have to do with like your observations uh, of how that's working. Like, um, let's put it this way. If it's a luminary, up to 10 degrees is totally fine. You're definitely probably going to feel it. If it's not a luminary, like let's say it's like Mercury or Venus or, I don't know, Mars, I would personally go at the max up to 6 degrees. But that's just my, per you know, if, if you see your chart and you see it making a wider orb than that, but you read the interpretation of what that conjunction between those two planets mean, and it rings true for you in your life, then by all means, then I guess it, you know, it's it works for you. But just from my personal experience with luminaries, you get a lot, you can use a lot wider of an orb variance. Yeah. So um, if you have, so this is where a good place to insert the fact that um, because you talked about, I have a lot of conjunctions in my chart. And the reason for that is because I have something called a stellium. And a stellium is when you have, now different astrologers are going to say slightly different things. Um, for me, it has to be at least four planets um, that are within the same sign or the same house. Now, some astrologers will say three. I think, Mike, you say only if it's in the same house. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say some astrologers, this astrologer has a totally different perspective. Yeah, so what's, how do you read a stellium? A stellium, to me, and you can a, a person can only have one stellium in their chart. There's no possible way for there to be more than one. I've seen people say, "Oh, I have three stelliums." Da, 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 da. You're you're retarded. A stellium is when there are three personal planets, three or more. Well, so there can only be up to four, but three or four personal planets in one house. And we're talking about the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, three or more in one house. And that's a stellium. That's a exertion of personal energy in one sign or in one area of life, in one house. Um, now, some if if you know if you've got Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, I think you can actually use Jupiter in a stellium too. I would, uh, from my interpretation, I would include Jupiter as well because it moves fast. Um, if you've got any of the outer planets mixed in there too, well, that just makes the stellium even stronger. But like, let's say you've got three slow-moving planets in one in one house. That is not a stellium. The people from the Capri or from the uh, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn generation, which is my generation, 
they they claim that they have a stellium and it's not a stellium it's not so for you it has to have personal how many personal planets three three or three more for it to be for okay. it to be a personal stellium now there's such thing as a generational stellium those exist especially for my generation but i still i wouldn't count that as a personal stellium okay <clears throat> so like we said there's there's slightly different opinions on what you need to make a stellium the point is it's a clusterfuck it's a whole bunch of planets making lots of conjunctions with one another they're blending all of that energy yeah and it's not a, and it's a good thing and it's a bad thing it's a good thing because Focusing on that particular area of life, the house that that stellium falls in, is like the key to unlocking several other areas of life. It's like your intro. You know, if you have a stellium in the fifth house, well, engaging in fifth house things can help you, you know, embody the the qualities of the eighth house, twelfth house, depending on what rulers of those planets or what houses those planets are ruling. But the downside to it is like, let's say you get a really heavy transit through that house. Like, let's say Saturn comes barreling down through there like it did with mine. It's actually just now starting to pass through that stellium, thank God. But uh, having a really heavy transit come through that stellium can make your life a living hell. Um, you know, it's interesting that you say focusing on that house. I'm kind of diverging from our our topic a little oh, bit. You, but uh, You wouldn't dare. I know, right? Um, I actually had a uh, gifted astrologer, a friend of mine for a long time, who introduced me to astrology, tell me that when there is a stellium in one of the house houses, you want to look to the opposite house to balance that stellium. And I can only speak from the truth of my life. And I have in the third house, my sun, my moon, my Saturn, my Venus, and my Pluto um, sitting in Scorpio. And so to balance all of that, like my brain is super busy all of the time and I don't shut up and I don't stop thinking and talking and all to balance that I go to the opposite side of the wheel to the ninth house, which is True. higher learning and, and education. And that balances me. There are external factors at play there in both yours and mine that modify that a little bit. So in your chart, you, the, see the fact that you have the nodal axis incorporated into your stellium makes that ring very true for you because your south node is mixed up in your stellium in the third true. house yeah so that's very true so my north node is in my ninth yeah. yeah exactly so going towards that opposite house is beneficial for you regardless mine is a little bit differently i have a clusterfuck of planets in the eighth house and the north node is up in there too so going back towards the second house isn't really all that Great. So maybe we just don't know because we're biased by our nodes. <laughs> well, yeah, no, when you have the nodal axis thrown in there, it throws everything off. Yeah, this is true. This yeah. is true. Um, it's a lot easier for Mike than it is for me because, you know, my south node where I, you know, we haven't, we haven't gotten into nodes, but, you know, where I should be moving away from is where all my planets are kind of pulling me back to it. And where I'm supposed to be going is where a lot of my planets are all packed in together. Yeah, they're all supporting that that yeah. pattern. And I have the part of fortune conjunct the north node, so... Ha! How lucky you. All right, so our next aspect is the opposition, which is 180 degrees. So the planets are on the opposite side of the wheel from one another. Yeah, and it's funny is I know I understand how the opposition works, and I'll explain that in a moment. But what is the general, the traditional meaning of the opposition? Do you do you remember? It's a polarity and a tension and a competitiveness. Yes, it's two planets that are competing with each other, and the way it operates is uh, like let's say there's two planets that are in opposition to each other. So like let's say Mars opposite Pluto, which God help you if you have that. <laughs> uh, the influence alternates between two planets yeah. one minute pluto will be taking the lead in terms of your personality and then the other minute mars will be taking the lead but since those planets are both related it's like aggressive underhanded aggressive 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 but if it you just the the it swings like a pendulum between each two planets one minute the mars part's taking control one minute the pluto part's taking control and it swings back and forth they're challenging each other they're competing with each other so what what was your thing that you don't you, you were you were trying to say something there about oppositions and how they sense. well no you said I understand how they work but there's something about them that kind of like screws with you 
Oh no, I just I just don't there's see behind every single aspect there is a term, a definition that describes it. And a way for be beginners to really start to and you know utilize aspects is you take the meaning of the two planets and then you apply the traditional meaning of the aspect. And so like let's say like it's a square, which we'll get into in a moment. The traditional meaning is an aspect of dynamic tension. So when you have Mars square Pluto, then you're thinking, well, my, my ego drive, my assertion, and my you know, desire to transform and my, the battery pack of my chart are in dynamic tension. So I was just trying to find that term that described the opposition. The opposition yeah. is, yeah, polarity. Of war. It's, yeah, it's like war. So, and what, what orb allowance do you give for an opposition? Uh, I use about five, six, seven, or seven at the most. What if it involves luminaries? I'd still keep it right around there. It's not as it's not as potent as the conjunction, in my opinion. Okay. So that's my opinion. What's your opinion? <clears throat> I agree. Okay. Good. <laughs> Okay, uh, so squares, you kind of mentioned a little bit uh, about squares. Yes? Yes, it's an aspect of dynamic tension. It's two planets that are conversating with each other, two parts of the personality that are talking to each other, but they're in... It, it's kind of like they're in the corner of the room at a party, and they're facing off with each other. Yeah, squares are, are really challenging, but they're challenges you can overcome, but they are nonetheless challenging. They're at a 90 degree angle to one another. Yes. Now, they're pretty potent aspects because it is a glaring, it's a big issue. People notice this in their personality, even if they don't know anything about astrology. It's an issue that pops up usually pretty early on in their life, depending on what planet it is. Uh they tend to figure out a way to manage it relatively early on in life. Unless it's Neptune. And even then. <laughs> no, Neptune, as hard aspects being made between a personal planet and Neptune, it's difficult to deal with just because of the... You can't see them. Yeah. yeah it, it's Because it, it's all about delusions. So it's a problem that Neptune's creating with an issue of the per, with a part of the personality, but you're deluded. You, you know, you delude yourself over the problem to begin with. So... Sometimes it can be rather challenging to even notice that there's a problem there. It's even worse if it's a fuck if it's a train or a sextile, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so I mean that's that's a square. So the next one on our on our little list here is trines, yeah. 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 So trines are um, 120 degrees apart, and they are really nice. They're very beneficial and harmonious and helpful. They're supportive aspects. It's two planets that are in the same or that are in different signs, but they're in the same element. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you have planets that are right on the brink, you know, really early or late in the sign, you can have an out of sign uh, trine, but typically, yes, they're going to be within the same, um, the same element. And we're going to give them about a, I don't know, in my opinion, a probably about a five degree orb, yeah. maybe a six if you're really wanting to push it. But I would agree with that. Uh, the tree, it's just an easy flow of energy. And uh, if there's a negative planet that is involved in a trine, like let's say it's like the moon trine Pluto, we've discussed that before. Pluto's still a malefic planet, it's still a planet that, that poses challenges and creates difficulty. So if it's a malefic planet that's in train, trying. <laughs> He's trying but, very hard to say it the way I want him to. <laughs> uh, if you see a malefic planet that's trining a personal planet, it's still going to experience the negative aspects of that, per of that planet, of the malefic planet, but it's not going to present itself in a way that's jarring and noticeable enough for you to really do anything about it. So there's actually a challenging aspect to the trine. Now, you know what? I want to throw a monkey wrench in there since, <laughs> we're, already, since we're already you... on trines. And let's talk about the grand trine. Oh, we're not going to do this in order now? You're just no, going to... No, I'm throwing a monkey wrench in there. And it makes sense. It's a perfect segue <laughs> into, the trine, into the grand trine. Yeah. You know a lot of serial killers have grand trines? 
So this makes sense, really. I mean, like you said, when you do have a malefic, it's basically like, you know, a trine is having a jet plane between two planets. The energy goes back and forth between them really easily. So, yeah, you're right. If you have malefics, it's going to it's going to be challenging. And yeah. and if you have a, a, a grand trine <clears throat> is when you have three planets making all up each other yeah yeah it'll look like a big triangle in your chart a big blue triangle and it looks really really pretty but depending on what planets are involved it can be evil or it can be awesome <laughs> yeah so like let's say you have a grand shrine and it's like mars saturn and pluto i'm sorry i know yeah. that's not that's a, like, that's not that's a like somebody who's ability to incorporate like violence and coldness is very well incorporated into their ego drive <laughs> so mm-hmm. they can you they, they have no qualms about using aggressive means underhanded means violent means to get what they want but like let's say it's like a trine between i don't know uh the moon jupiter and venus that is amazing that is like the most socially acceptable nice so it's like a social butterfly kind of thing that's great as somebody who's really really optimistic somebody who's really good at socializing really good at being pleasant somebody that doesn't get flustered by their feelings too bad well unless there's other aspects that negate that but still it could be really really good or it could be really really bad it just depends on the planets involved in the houses of course but yep so um the next one we have is a sextile and a sextile is also a harmonious aspect, but it's not as active or dynamic as a trine. A sextile is more of like an opportunity, and it's the planets are 60 degrees apart. We use a little bit smaller of an orb with those, probably a three to five degree orb. But you were saying something really interesting about sextiles <laughs> before we started. Oh, I'll don't die. That. I'll get into that about sextiles. Sextiles is a part of the personality that is... Not always there, but when you need it, you can use it. It's, a, it's like a talent. Um, and it does represent opportunity in the natal chart. A sextile, if you see a, a sextile between two masculine planets, it, is, it, it creates situations where opportunities are presented to individuals, and they can take it. And then if they're happening in feminine energies like the sextiles between one planet in Virgo and one planet in Scorpio. Uh, That's an aspect that implies the need to seek out opportunity. So, like, for instance, in my chart, there are quite a few sextiles in my chart, but they're all in masculine signs. And it, I don't know, I just, I have this weird way of having opportunities just fall in my lap, and I get the luxury of being able to decide whether or not I want to take them. And that's that's a very that's rung very true in my life. I have like a, the Moon sextile, the Ascendant. I have Mars sextile, the Midhaven. I've got uh, Mercury sextile, Saturn, all happening in uh, air and fire. Yeah, you so. do. You you do get like these random things that pop up, and it's like, wow, that's a. Uh... But you know what? It, it, with you though, it seems to work both ways. You, you get some really crappy things that pop up for you too. True. Yeah, but it all it all comes out in the end, Mike's way. So don't screw yeah. with Mike because it's gonna come out his way. Yeah, I, it's all that mutable energy, and also Mars and Sagittarius at the seventeenth degree is considered exceptionally lucky, and uh, that that's what I love about mutable energy. It's about like the art of going through a lot of shit, but for some reason always coming out clean on the other side. <laughs> You do. Smelling like a rose. Yep. All right. So those are all of our major aspects. Those are the ones that you're going to see the lines drawn to when you pull up a chart um, right off the bat, except for one of them. One of them will pop up anyway, even if you don't select it um, on astro.com. But the next one is it's a minor aspect, but it's a major pain in the ass. Oh, the in conjunction you you know you want to say quincunx i hate that fucking word <laughs> it's like moist <laughs> to some people <laughs> um, like, no, I, there is this fucking retarded ass english astrologer 
I'm not going to use any names, but he was very young and not very good at all. And um, he was uh, talking about some girl he was obsessed with at the moment. And he was like, oh, and I noticed my North Node was Quincunx Herb. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, so it's from... I, I refuse to call it that now. Like, I don't like that word. It's just it is... It is a a bit of a... a it's the most pretentious sounding fucking word. See, to me, it just sounds dirty. Like, quincunx. <laughs> if I'm ever, like, a stripper or I'm going to make, or, like, a porn star, like, that's going to be my my last name. I'm so... going to be, like... I'm going to be, like... Um, I don't know, like, Brit... Brit Tadashia, Tadashia, quincunx. Yeah. That, t- you're good at coming up with these names on the fly, man. Okay, so the in <laughs> with that lovely introduction, um, the in conjunct is a hundred and fifty degrees apart, and it is really unstable. <laughs> it's okay. So this is how the in conjunction was described to me, and I thought it was hilarious ever since. The <laughs> the the in con- okay. So like, let's say you're driving a car, and like. A square is like, okay, you got a flat tire, you got to fix it. Or opposition's like, the battery's dead, you got to do something about it, you got to work on it. And in conjunction's like, that check engine light that's been on for a while, and you, you've been, you know, you've been dealing with it for so long that you just kind of ignore it, but you're, you really should check out that engine. <laughs> <laughs> Until it explodes. Yeah. So um, that, I thought that was a perfect analogy for it. Yeah, they're just really awkward. Like, if we're going to do analogies, it's like the two people at a party that, you know, kind of awkwardly bump into each other while they're trying to get a beer and, like, maybe spill it on the other one. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry. And accidentally, like, do a boob grab when they're trying to, you know, wipe up the beer. It's just awkward and annoying. And, yeah, that's an in conjunct. It's like... Okay, so I I experienced a situation with this uh, while I was uh, locked up. Um, I got put in a room with somebody who was very, very intellectually handicapped. Uh, not, not like physically handicapped, like or not mentally handicapped in like the medical sense, but just uh, not a very smart person. And um, he's covered in like acne and just not a very pleasant person to be around. And I was stuck in a holding cell with him. And so me and him were just sitting there staring at each other, not really sure what to say. And it was really, really awkward. And I remember I was like, this is what it is. It, it's funny how our mind works. So this is just like, this is what an in conjunction feels. <laughs> I'm stuck in a room with it. So it's two planets that are being forced to make a conversation with each other, but they don't really have anything to say because they have nothing in common. Yes. So that's it's actually for, the best analogy right there. So it's just, it's, it just force, it just creates awkwardness. Yeah. It creates, this, it creates dysfunction. So with your minor aspects, you're going to use a much smaller orb. Oh, yeah. Two degree orb at the max. Sometimes three for an in conjunction, but I was pushing it. Yeah. Two yeah. degree max. Okay. So then our favorite minor aspects that should not be called minor aspects because they're just so darn adorable. Harmonics. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, you know, all aspects are part of a harmonic chart. But this one is part of the fifth harmonic chart, which now we're getting into, you know, a whole nother ball game. But a harmonic chart is basically a chart that shows a specific area like with a microscope. And the fifth harmonic chart is what shows your talents. And the, the big part of a harmonic chart is the biquintile and the quintile. Yes. So the quintile is... They both mean sort of the same thing. There's, they, only, there's only minor variances between the two. <laughs> So a quintile is when two planets are 72 degrees away from each other. And then the biquintile is double the quintile. So they're 144 degrees away from each other. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So those are going to show specific areas of talent and giftedness. The biquintile is a little, uh, the word I use is urgent they are a little more readily accessed yeah there's a really goofy playful energy associated with um with that aspect like for instance i did a chart for one guy while i was locked up 
Uh, that's really weird for me to say. But uh, he had this kind of like goofiness about him that was it was very it was hard to put your finger on. He was very playful and goofy, and but it was one of those things that's like so adorable, and you can't like you can't. It's very difficult. It's very weird to kind of think of. But whenever I draw drew his chart up, I noticed that uh, Venus and the Moon in his chart were quintile to each other, and with those both being you know socially related, at least the feminine side of sociality, um, I was like that would explain that because it it just creates his his emotional instinctual nature and his way of mm, I don't know, the Venusian thing, the, the Libra side of Venus, the socializing aspect of his personality, it's just it's just created this lovable goofiness. <laughs> so um, they, you know, obviously it's going to depend on what what planets they're in between. But this is actually a really good way to check somebody's intelligence. Um, for example, because it's going to show talent, right? Or so, lack or lack thereof. Yeah. So if you're seeing quintiles and biquintiles that Mercury is throwing, like for example, my husband has a Mercury quintile Jupiter, a Mercury quintile Uranus, and a Mercury quintile the Ascendant. That means he's an excellent communicator. He can think on his feet. He can think fast. He's got a great way of philosophizing and speaking to people, but it, and it's presented well because it's making this quintile with the ascendant. So he can do all of it. And, you know, so he, he can think on his feet and he can say it in a way that people are going to get it. Um, that's, especially if you see like Mercury and Uranus together, um, making quintiles and biquintiles. That's like, oh, my Mercury really is not making a quintile to anything. I'm sorry, sweetheart. Um, Does I'll, mean I'm stupid? No, I'll, I'll hold you and comfort you later, and we'll talk about it, okay? We'll talk it out. Man, I want it so bad to not be stupid. Oh, cool, Uranus is, Uranus is by Quintal, my ascendant. Score! So I actually did a whole, like, case study thing, um, and I wasn't, like, really exactly prepared for this today, so let's see if I can find it. But um, where where I tried to find intelligence in the natal chart. So here it is. Yeah, traits of high intelligence. So basically, I pulled up um, all of the people that you can think of who are absolutely brilliant, historical, and modern figures, and to see what was, like, happening quite frequently in these charts. And... The moon um, making biquintiles like to the ascendant, to the midheaven, to Neptune, um, biquintiles, those are markers, but you have to have Mercury and Uranus involved in it too. We'll have to do like a whole a whole podcast on that Let's one see. sometime. My... Now I'm Mike sorry. really needs to know if he's smart. You're smart, so, sweetie. <laughs> my moon is in the third house making a biquintile to the sun, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then Mercury is treating the moon, and uh, Uranus is biquintile the ascendant, and then the ascendant is sextile the moon. Okay, I'm smart. Okay, cool. We're cool with that. I'm cool with that. <sighs> We're going <laughs> to... High, like, high intelligence that is notable for, like, you know... Einstein level intelligence, you'll see a lot of biquintiles and quintiles. Anyway, that's that's our point to this <laughs> little tirade. Um, but they are they are talent. You can see people um, like making like Venus biquintile to Neptune. They're <sighs> going to be some type of don't die on me there, Mike. You've been real coffee. Um, they. And you're drinking coughing and you're drinking coffee. The, a lot of artists, um, singers, you know, people, people that make things beautiful, they will have these kind of aspects. So the next one we want to do, man, this one like always is is a tongue tie. Hey, wait, actually. What? Oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about the Sesca Quadrant. But no, we didn't go over this earlier. I just want to backtrack. What's the, <laughs> what's the org allowance for a sextile? For a sextile? Yeah. Oh, see, uh, classically, them sexy, them sexy sex styles. Classically, it's five. I don't look at it past three. Damn. Okay. Are you still trying to figure out if you're smart? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Now, can we talk about the Sessa quadrant? Quadrate? Yes. Sessa? Yes. Sessa? Sessa? So hard. Sesca quadrant. <laughs> yeah, that. Or Sesca quad, which is what a lot of astrologers 
say, uh, just to make it quicker. So. Okay. The quad or an S quad. It's just a really hard word, man. Okay. So this is 135 degrees apart. Mm -hmm. And um, and and you had a very um, forceful outburst about the uh, Sessa quadrate earlier. Yeah, well, go tell tell the class what you learned, Brittany. <laughs> well, I have looked at <laughs> I have looked at them as being like kind of a tense, you know, but mild sort of disconnected, discombobulated kind of just, you know, I don't know, energy. But um but Mike insists that and he's probably right. <laughs> that, that they show like mishaps and faulty planning and what'd you say miscommunication yeah misunder it's 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 mistakes made through misunderstandings uh faulty planning or miscommunication okay so i have, have none of those i have no Suska quadrants whatsoever in my chart hmm. i don't know if i have any now i want to go see I haven't really paid attention to the uh because I can't pronounce it, so I I don't really want to talk about it. I I have a Mars um Sessa quadrant to my midheaven. Yes. Actually. Oh. Um, which is is that why I piss everybody off at work and I didn't really mean to? <laughs> Probably. And also in your Mars in the second house. Yeah. So that's why you're not rich. Yeah. Poor me. Okay, so well, what a Sesca quadrant is 135, two planets that are 135 degrees away from each other. And it is a dotted black line that most people ignore. In fact, I ignored it for the first couple of years that I even practiced astrology. I still uh, ignore it because <laughs> I can't say it. <laughs> can't ignore. Crazy people <laughs> have lots of Sesca quadrants in their charts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I don't ignore it. I just, I just can't say the damn word. The, the thing about minor aspects, minor hard aspects like the Sesca Quadra and the In Conjunction, they are definitely a problem, but you don't realize it all that much. Like you don't, it, it's, it, it isn't a glaring issue. Other people notice that bullshit, but <laughs> you seem to be blissfully unaware that you're <laughs> fucking everybody's life up around you. <laughs> That, nice. That's a fun thing about those little minor hard aspects. <laughs> uh, like I said, I've seen the craziest people in my life. I've done their charts up, and I'm looking at Suska quadrants just going everywhere for days. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know you what? Hmm. You want to back crazy a little bit? Since we didn't go over this earlier, um, oh. I'm sorry. I have Mar I, I have uh, Uranus by Quintal the Ascendant. So yeah, I get patient with him bring things up um what about combust planets that are combust okay so yeah this is a a kind of an ancient technique um but i, I feel to ring true and i'll tell you why in a few minutes after i uh, grade you on your response okay so <laughs> <laughs> so there's kind of there's That's two things fuck. i just need to test it I know you have this this urge to do it all the time. Mike is this really fun thing that he likes to do where he asks me a question and then he tells me that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's favorite favorite thing. Okay, so a combustion is when something is super close to the sun, like between you know a up up to eight degrees is the traditional view of a combust planet. It's like from one minute and 59 seconds or sorry, one degree. And is it 59 seconds uh, to like eight degrees is like a bad, a bad thing because it's combust. So it's so close to the sun that its energy is just sort of consumed by it. But a Kazemi is when it is so close to the sun, it's one degree or, or less. And it's actually a really good thing. Yes. Um, it has a Kazemi in the chart. Usually when they're talking about combust, I mean, they can refer to several different planets, but usually they're talking about Mercury or Venus. Because uh, they travel close, yes. yes. And when you see Mercury combust the sun, it can create a problem uh, because the individual sometimes has a little bit of a difficult time seeing themselves objectively. And Venus conjunct the sun creates... A different effect. It depends on the sign. That's a big thing. Um, 
because in certain signs, the sun is weaker. We talked about it in a previous video, what, what signs the sun is in detriment in, what signs it's exalted in or at home in. And uh, if you see the sun and Venus conjunct in, let's say, a sign where the sun does really well, like Aries, Leo, Capricorn, Scorpio, uh, you'll see the sun completely overpower Venus, and it creates a situation for the individual where the person is usually, or has a history of letting issues related to the ego, the career, where they want to go in life, they will put that in front of their relationships. But on the inverse, if you see it in a sign where Venus is really strong, like let's say you see it happening in Taurus or Libra or Aquarius, because um, Venus actually does very well in Aquarius. You'd think it wouldn't, but it does. Uh, actually, that person will take the Venusian elements and they will... They'll sacrifice like their career for their relationships. They'll sacrifice what they want in life, their vitality for their relationships. You see the opposite effect if it's in a sign where the sun isn't doing so well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's true. I've seen it. No, no, I did. It's just, yeah. It's My mom good. does that. My mom has uh, the sun and Venus conjunct in, uh, in Aquarius, and she'll definitely put the partner's needs ahead of her own at the end of the day. What about the luminaries? So like mine, when the moon and the sun are, you know, super close together, is that still a combustion or no? No, I wouldn't count it as one, but that's just my personal preference um, because that creates a whole different effect. So I honestly, what it does is, first of all, it means you're born under a new moon. And um, I think... The, the effect that it tends to have is the emotional needs and the needs of the vitality are very much, mm, they're, they're very in line with each other. So it creates a person who understands. Very emotional they, creatures. They can be. It depends on what sign. But it's very much so somebody who knows what they need to be happy. And there's very much a sense. There's like a, it's like a lack of complexity. Just to say the least, like it's a person who's who's what they need to be happy and what they want with themselves are, are sort of in line. Okay, moving on. Uh, the semi square, forty five two planets that are forty five degrees apart from each other. Yeah, these are mildly challenging, like the square, not as in your face as a square, but it's still there. It's still a problem. Especially if the two planets are aggressive and malefic, it can be a problem. Um, I tend to like to use the semi-square in predictive analysis a lot. I don't, I mean, I pay attention to it in an anal chart, but not as in-depth, of course. Yeah, there's so much to see in a natal chart before you even get down to these little minor angles that it, it can be overwhelming, I feel like, for somebody. Like, if I'm talking to somebody and going over their natal chart, for me to break down every single aspect in fact if you have an astrologer i'll just go ahead and say it if your astrologer goes through your natal chart by breaking down every single placement and aspect they have been doing this for about five minutes so yeah. find a new astrologer i know i know I, I actually had somebody do a synastry analysis for me and she just basically listed out all of the aspects and what they mean between the two planets and it literally taught me nothing yeah, yeah. they've got to know how to blend <laughs> Blend. Okay, and then and then this the semi sextile same sort of thing. In fact, this is like the the god the semi sextile to me is like the weakest shit on the planet. It's still it, in the ass. See, the thing the the sextile is usually beneficial. The semi sextile is not. That's what I'm saying. It's so weak. It's just like the sextile itself is already like a little bit more passive. It's more you know, hey, this can be a thing if you let it or if you go after it. It's not just like blatant and in your face. And then you take it and make it a semi-sextile, which is a 30-degree um, angle. And it's just like, eh. <laughs> One time I, I found a, a $5 bill on the road, you know. <laughs> it's just <laughs> great. One time I got a library book and I didn't return it. <laughs> yeah, that's a so like, I have Mars, I have Mars semi-sextile Pluto. 
Um, at a three degree orb. Oh god, that's not, like, not even a thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you didn't catch that joke, <laughs> Mars and Pluto together are very angry and <laughs> aggressive, and he's trying to prove that his his little baby semi sextile Mars and Pluto at <laughs> a three degree orb can be angry too. That's like a two year old who's like, no, I I I'm really mad that you took my pancakes away. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got I I do have Mars and Mercury conjuncts, so I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. One time you got you got a little bit crabby with me because you thought I didn't think you were smart, <laughs> which oh, is yeah. not true. No, I wasn't. I was just playing. I'm joking. I was joking. <laughs> I'm just taking a joke. You're like one time when I was locked up, I stabbed a motherfucker because he said I wasn't smart. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Okay. okay, so those are, are all of your aspects and how to interpret them. And next time we are going to talk about aspect patterns. That's a big one because you're taking the individual aspects that we just described and then you're working them into the context of a bigger picture. And aspect patterns generally are going to show you the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for tuning into Outrage Astrology. Just know that we, also, we have our uh, podcast on Spotify. Uh, iTunes, Google Play Music. It's also hosted on Podbean, and you can get in contact with either of us for consultation or to ask questions, preferably a consultation though, at <laughs> outrageastrology at gmail.com. Yep, we put out new content every week, so make sure to subscribe, and we will catch you next time. I'm Brittany. Name's Mike. <laughs>